beginning uh, was mixed. And we'll, I'm sure we'll talk about it a little bit uh, more about who my mentors were and how I had to mix that training up. Um, uh, but I did have some really good training at the university, um, and but I also had some good training from you know some of the black theater giants out there. Yeah, you know what I love uh, theater and the training. And uh, for those of you who just joined us, we were having some technical difficulties, but um, I had to hit the the button, and I hit the button, and we're fine now. So. <laughs> So we are uh, interviewing uh, Andre Meekins and Natasha Williams, both in the theater field. And Natasha, you go back to uh, to uh, School of the Arts. Can you talk a little bit about your training at the School of the Arts? Sure, sure, I'd love to. Um, attending the University of North Carolina School of the Arts, and it's so funny that we're talking about that school. I was just talking to a good friend of mine the other night about our training and our experience at the North Carolina School of the Arts and all that it entailed. And just how important, you know, how important it was at that time to understand that as a, a young artist, your, your mind, your filter, how you view um, becoming a theater artist is that it's so important to know that you are going to have access and you're going to learn about how to do everything because theater really truly is a foundation type of acting. Um, and sometimes when you go out into the world and start to pursue your career, what you'll realize is that the work that you're given or you're offered isn't, isn't ever as weighty or as textured or as layered um, as far as plays versus theater, TV, and film. Right. So take advantage of that experience, um, that live interaction, that live connection with you and the audience, that visceral experience, take full advantage of it because on your journey, sometimes you may not ever uh, have the opportunity to approach the work the way you would in theater. So it's, it's a great foundation. And I think it's very important, I think it's imperative if you're really serious about acting to at least get some sort of theater training first, paramount. Yeah, exactly. And and Andre, University of North Carolina, Greensboro, that's where you yeah. hail from. Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah, it was, it was a great experience. Um, uh, and, and again, it grew me up in so many ways that, you know, I really, advocate for anybody who's serious about uh this this industry to find you know somebody to mentor you even if you don't end up at a university find somebody to be a mentor who has the training so that you can right. at least understand if they push you like natasha is saying if they push you in the training you know coming out <laughs> you will be a breed you know yeah you know so uh so it, so it, it it was a a, a situation where you know, we had to deal with being advocates and making sure that we got ours, you know, sometimes being carted on campus because I'm a black male trying to get onto, a, you know, predominantly white campus. Sometimes you have to, you know, mm -hmm. you have to say, okay, I belong here. Uh, yeah. and, then, uh, and then the fact though, that there are those moments where you understand where uh, you have everybody on campus that you're probably going to deal with in life, every type of person, every culture, uh, and you really get a chance to, you know, to immerse yourself in that too. Yeah. And that's not to knock the HBCU experience because I, I teach at one now and I love that experience because it, and it's different, but we do get a chance to really touch the lives of our students. Sometimes some of the students who may not have had all of the advantages that, uh, that some other, you know, people have had growing up but they still get the same training and they get the same love, you know, that kind of love that says, Hey, let's make this work. You know, yeah. that kind of mama and them love, you know? <laughs> yeah. Michelle. 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 Yeah. So have you um, thought about, you know, like when you go out to mentor others, like what advice would you, like what are like three big things that you would let them know as they start their journey, whether it's voiceovers or, you know, acting? 
Okay, um, thank you. That's a great question. Um, the three things that I tend to try to share with young people who are pursuing the arts is to figure out your five innate gifts. Um, because these are the things that I wish someone would have shared with me on this journey of pursuing my career. Because you're trained to be an actor and you're trained in the theater, you may go out into the world and think, well, first of all, I know I can act and I can act on the stage. But figuring out what your innate gift is right. will have help you to tap more so into your destiny. Oh, okay. You have to feel like this is a journey, number one, but also figure out what are some of the things you could do, like you could do them in your sleep, you know. Right. Um, so I sat back actually not long ago, maybe less than 10 years ago, and thought to myself, well, what do you do naturally? What's just something that just you could do in your sleep and you could call it a job? And I thought, well, I like to talk. <laughs> I talk a lot. Um, and people yeah. always tell me, yeah, and people always tell me, you have a very nice voice. I mean, mm -hmm. I could be, you know, making an appointment at a doctor's mm -hmm. office and they'd say, oh, wow, you have a very nice speaking voice. So I started thinking about those things because those are your innate gifts. If you speak well, if you have a very nice speaking voice, the texture of your voice, um, and knowing that I was funny. I always knew confidently that I was a funny person. Um, I always made people laugh, always told really funny stories. So those are three innate gifts. One of my fourth innate gifts, we're not gonna make this in the, the, the Natasha show, but I'll share with you. One of my fourth innate gifts is being a caretaker. If anyone were to ever get sick around me, even when I was little, like I'm talking six, seven, eight years old, if someone ever got sick, I was the kid that would literally take care of you, bring you water, um, make sure you had tea. You know, I was the one who was always coming to prop your pillow up. You didn't have to tell me to do it. Instinctually, I naturally would sit with you and take care of you. Mm -hmm. So those are definitely four of my innate gifts that I've used in the arts on some level or another. Mm -hmm. And I can, I can kind of testify to that. Every time I have a okay. meeting in Tasha, she is uh, she is taking care of us. Whether we're sick or not, we're taking care of us. She, <laughs> yes. she makes sure that you know everybody's okay mm -hmm. with whatever food we're gonna get. Right. You know, so so she's always been <laughs> there, and she'll call me just to find out, are you okay? You know what's happening in your world. So, uh, so I do appreciate that. <laughs> sure. And we're actually gonna do some big things together. We'll see. Yes, this, this, that's this right. Time. COVID, uh, oh, yeah. we can get a handle yeah. on that. Um, we're, we're go ahead. Well, I was going to say that the three things I would say uh, to add to that would be understand that your journey is your journey, right? right. You, you, can, you can get some things from watching somebody else's success, but you can't surmise that that's the way that's going to happen for you. And then you also have to define mm. what success is for you. You know, right. you know, you can feel successful whether you are a household name or a face that people see weekly uh, or every time you turn on the television. Mm -hmm. or success is mm -hmm. the fact that you're you know, that you're teaching or that you're helping somebody else to get there, um, that you are um, mm -hmm. that you you're working in the regional circuit or wherever your you know, wherever your market you're in. You're doing a great job, you know, to see your face up on a billboard in that market. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. um, see yourself in a grocery store or something, you know, whatever, yeah. wherever that success is, what, you know, you define that and don't let anybody else define that for you. And then three, do it for yourself. Mm -hmm. Have fun doing right. it. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, um, but work this craft as a, as a, as a craft. You have to invest in yourself just like you would any other job. Yeah. Uh, and you have to make sure that, mm -hmm. that, you are doing the work that somebody's not asked you to do. Right. right? You know, and mm -hmm. especially with all this technology today, you can you can Google anybody, any acting right. technique. You can just put in acting technique or just acting and see what comes mm -hmm. up and, and just go for, for months on that, maybe years, just on that information. So, you know, so mm -hmm. those are the three things I would say. And you mm -hmm. know, she's like. You know she's playing the mother, right? You know. You, you know, know I think it's so interesting how 
when you're, well, I've seen, you know, quite a few of your commercials and you add a little comedy to it. Like, yes, you know, she there does. are some that are serious, but you bring <laughs> this extra life. Like, oh, I saw the one when she was um, in the hair salon. <laughs> oh, yeah. That oh, one oh, is a good one. With, her, with the rollers in it. <laughs> <laughs> That, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, you know, that one, that one was about about voting, or what was it? Was something you were supposed to run out and do? Um, to get my flu shot, something like right, that. Right, yeah, right. yeah. Shot. Reminding people right. to take shot. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but it's a, I'm glad you're sharing that because, again, on my journey, starting at the University of North Carolina School of the Arts, what's ironic about that is that at the School of the Arts. Commercials were, were never really taught, were never really focused on, uh, were never even really encouraged. You know, uh, when you go through a classical theater training program, they're really preparing you for the classics. You know, uh, they're pre preparing you to know how to do Shakespeare, um, Euripides, restoration plays, things of that nature, classical work. Right. Um, at that time, they didn't really focus on contemporary work as much like August Wilson stuff. We did like a couple of workshops, right. but not a lot. Um, but God is so good that my journey led me into this medium. And I'll share something with you that's really interesting too. And I think about this a lot. My dad, who was an aspiring singer, um, and he started in a quartet in New York. And mm -hmm. it was uh, four of them, of course, because it's and they opened for like the Supremes at one point. So they were right. trying to get some traction and they were doing work, you know, all throughout the Northeast, but they never got a break. And so my dad decided, well, let me see about commercials. You know, I guess he'd seen ads mm -hmm. for it or something. And he went and got hit shots and stuff like that done. And he started pursuing commercials. And I'm sure maybe some of you may be too young to know this one. But there was an ad for Don't Squeeze the Charmin. You guys oh, remember yeah. that? I Don't remember Squeeze that. the Charmin. There was a guy. Mm -hmm. remember that? Yeah. He uh, was for a role of that nature at that time. Mm -hmm. And um, by the time he started to break, he started getting called back in for that kind of work, commercial work. He had passed away. He died mm -hmm. of chronic kidney disease. Oh, okay. But what's ironic about that was if I would have connected to what my dad was innately good at, and where he had left off, I probably would have started in that medium a much earlier time in my career. Right. I just got into this medium like maybe nine years ago now. Mm -hmm. So it just goes to show you start thinking about everything that's connected to you, particularly right. people in your family. I'm yeah. sure all of you, and I'd like to ask if all of you um, have either relatives or maybe family members who had a desire to be in the arts. Is that true? Usually it is, it's usually in the blood in some ways. Well, not for me. Um, I'm the first one. Yeah, yeah, I'm the first one. But but that leads really? to a question that that we need to talk about that our fans really need to hear. People who want to be in this field, isn't it great to be in a field, love what you're doing, and get paid for it? That's what's so important that I tell my students Absolutely. all the time that you need to work at what you do to be good at it, you know, it's not, everybody see people on TV and then film and think, oh, I can do that. But there's a lot of training, there's a lot of work involved. Right. Uh, Andre, speak to that, please. You, you're a teacher right. like I am. Yeah, um, I have been teaching long enough to, to see students, former students, you know, come back and, and appreciate, the, you know, the hard time I gave them or, oh, yeah. if, I, or if I decided, you know, okay, Three a week before the show opens, we're switching. You're going to be the lead now because you know all the lines. You know everybody's lines, and I need you to be the lead. I, I don't think I could do this. And and so, how come your first show when you come back after you graduate? I'm glad you did that because they did that to yep. me. You know, mm -hmm. in the show I was in, mm -hmm. they knew they knew I knew all the lines. So at the last minute, they switched me to the lead. I said I was right. aware you before. You know, and a lot of times as teachers, we're very intuitive. Uh, can be almost spiritual sometimes because we prepare each individual students for for that journey uh, that they're going to take. 
not knowing sometimes that that's exactly what they're going to be dealing with. We just kind of feel right. it. And sometimes I just go with it because I, I say, why am I treating this student like this? Well, nine times out of 10, it's because this student needs that treatment. Needs you know, to be for their, pushed. For their life's journey. We're actually uh, being used as an instrument to go ahead of what was happening in their life. Um, I will say, uh, mm -hmm. ditto uh, Natasha's story. My father was a singer as well, and he was in a band. They made a record, um, okay. had, had an A and a B side. They opened up for the Isley Brothers back in the day. And, okay. um, but wow. what he did find that journey that it was really hard to get a record deal, especially back then. Uh, a couple of white groups took mm -hmm. their songs and made oh. hits out of them. And they didn't really get a chance to do that. So uh, oh. so they kind of fell apart and started their own journeys in different ways. My dad had children and then we, you know, that then that whole thing took on another um, another a whole picture for him. But he actually named me right. after his after his stage singing name. And I didn't know that until after he died. His stage name was Oliver. Wow. Ain't that so named me. So how would I how else was I gonna do anything else in life? And I tried. So many other things. I mean, I was going to be a lawyer. Uh, maybe I, you know, I, I tried medical, and then theater kept coming back up. Uh, right. Television, film kept coming back up, and I was mm -hmm. like, "Really? Is this really what I'm going to be, right. be doing?" That's so that, exactly that. That does happen. Right. So, so that that training and uh, having um, students understand, take inventory of your whole life. Like I said, you know, that journey begins with everything you're dealing with. You might be smart. Right. Uh, enough to do biology like nobody's business, then maybe you're the next um, you're the next person on on their science show, their science guy, science lady. Uh, you might whatever your strength is, you can incorporate that into your artistic journey. You might write a play about that field or that part of you that's really interesting that you know a lot about, and do a one person show, and then you're a star because of because of that. So there's all kinds of ways and. And again, not being a household name doesn't mean that you're not successful, you know. That's right. You know, I you oh, asked me to not. send some stuff in, you know, I, I thought about it. If I had had access to my office, I could have sent in my, my wave cap picture back in the day. I, I did have <laughs> uh, so I, I could have yep. sent in picture uh, <laughs> being one of the first wave cap uh wave cap models in the mm. country. And I, you know, that that helped me to kind of Kind of see that my journey in this was, you know, was something that was going to be okay, um, you know. But teaching was something I really had more of a passion for as well. So. Right. Mm -hmm. Michelle, let's talk mm -hmm. about the mm -hmm. marketing side. You you were in the marketing. Talk to them about that branding and stuff like that, Michelle. And then before you do, Michelle, um, say um, that one more time. Be before you do, I just a little say, delay. I was I was asking you oh, to okay. talk about Let's marketing say. yourself. I can't hear anything. Marketing? He was asking about marketing yourself, branding. Okay, let me let me yeah, take it back yeah, in. Okay, and see if that helps. Technical difficulties. Yeah. Okay, is that better? Michelle, is that better? Well, let's. Okay, you hear me? Yeah, we hear you now. Yes. Yes. Okay. So, what was your question again? I'm sorry. Uh, I was saying to let's talk about marketing yourself and doing and uh, branding and stuff like that. Mm, that's a good question. Oh, okay. So, um, when it comes to bringing yourself or putting yourself out there for people to find you, um, how did, how can one get started? I mean, I know we have social media. Do you find social media working? Do you feel like it's more the face to face? You know, everything right now has been, it's all on some platform on the internet, on social media. Do you find that beneficial or do you think that, you know, with an individual wanting to brand themselves, should they go another route? Well, I, I will say, I, I think, because um, I know Natasha has a really good thing on branding, a workshop she actually does. But I, yes, so I'll just say something very briefly about um, 
a lot of people want to know how do I how do I get discovered? How do how do I land that big deal, right. that commercial, that film? Really, um, again, it's it's going to vary. Um, I would say do not pay any money mm-hmm. to have somebody say I want to be your agent. Right. Don't do that because some people get so desperate mm. to be seen that they actually go to these these modeling agencies and pay you know four hundred seven hundred dollars to be in something when really your agent is supposed to be the one finding you know uh, jobs right. for you and they make money yep. off of of what they get for you. So I would I would say first of all don't go out there in a local market you know paying for an agency. Um, secondly, I would say. Mm-hmm. Find somebody that you know that can mentor you because your journey, your walk in this and in, in getting in may may be really different than what you read about. Um, right. And then, you know, there's still that thing where Atlanta, New York, and LA, all the places that you you're going to you know have to invest in being in order if you want to get that that big time job. If you mm-hmm. you know they, that the only place you can do it is 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 on television major motion picture and you know and, and Broadway, then those are the cities you're gonna have to go to to right. make sure or, or at least be in contact with. Right. Uh, have some friends there or some family there that you're in touch with, not because you want something all of a sudden, but because you've developed this relationship, you know, and then you can, you know, when it's time, you can make that um you can make that move. Networking at, at festivals. There are film festivals, there are theater right. festivals out there. Uh, that if you want to go to a network, you can actually volunteer for some of these festivals so that you can end up meeting, because all these festivals bring in a celebrity of some type or a producer or a director that's done some big things, and you can meet somebody there. Um, you might not meet that big person, but you might meet that mentor that can lead you to two or three you know, nice opportunities. So, you know, so those are some of the things. And of course, social media, but you know, social media is saturated, and yeah, you can make some money on it. But can you sustain a career off of you know? Uh, some right. people have, you know, Issa Rae, you know, did her thing. Uh, but you really have to be so dedicated to it and so versed in it that this is an everyday thing. You can't just, you know, just dial it in. Right, Natasha, your Brandon. Yes, yes, I, um, I agree wholeheartedly with what Professor Minkins mentioned, but I also think as well, as long as you try to stay as proactive as you can, because we're in a, in a time now where people are creating their own vehicles more so than not. I mean, you think about someone like Tyler Perry what? and how he started with doing the plays and the plays led him to own his own studio and then doing TV and film. But technically, I think Tyler Perry is all of what, six, five or so. He would have been quite difficult to cast in most of the stuff that he has produced. But the reality is he was smart enough to think if I have create my own vehicle for whatever it is on whatever, you know, on whatever medium that I'm really trying to get into, you have a better advantage when you're proactive. Now with me, I advise this to students a lot when I lecture. Go to some, if you, if you don't want to go that route alone, because trust me, I'm not really one for, going, for doing a lot of projects on my own either, but this is what I do believe I can do very well. I will go during lunchtime hours. I used to before the pandemic, of course. Go mm-hmm. during um, lunchtime hours, be one or two o'clock. Go to some of the libraries of while you're on campus of some of the universities like Columbia in New York, the Columbia University. Around those areas, a lot of the kids hub around, like you'll see like some Asian American students sometimes, and they're like working on um, animation with wow. their laptops and they're working on a project and maybe two students sitting in the coffee shop. True story. And I was like, oh, wow, that's really cool. What, what kind of project is that? And so he told me and we engaged and we started talking. Um, there was a character that they needed a African-American voice for. And because I engaged with them, he gave me his card, uh, we exchanged information. And um, I think it was probably about five or six months later, we reconnected 
and I was the voice on one of their projects. Now, okay. I didn't get paid for it. <clears throat> I didn't get paid for it, and it didn't bother me because this is new for me. You know, this is experience to do animation. But the reality is, one of those kids submitted his project in a um, in one of those competitions, and he won. So the next thing that he's going to do that's big, who knows? He may remember me and use me. Yep. So this is what I mean about aligning yourself with, with kids or with people who have a project. And they may say to you at some point, hey, you know, I remember you from uh, when you did that project for us for free. We met in the coffee house. Hey, well, I just got a deal with Universal. And I'd love you to come in and play the mom for that role. You see what I mean? So right. yep. always aligning yourself laterally. Always align yourself laterally. Don't, don't start looking for the top carry and hunting him down and calling him. Look for some of the students who might be interested in doing that. And on their come up, sometimes they take you with them. Yeah, that happens. Yeah. Yeah, I, actually have one, I actually have one of my students put me in a film after I trained him and he went out there. He went to a film festival, did a pitch, mm -hmm. and, and won, you know, won the eye or the admiration of these producers. And he, he actually produced Four, mm -hmm. they, they produced four films with him, uh, and I was able to be on two of them. So, so yeah, so yeah, so student yeah. films, you know, people who are who are who are your colleagues or your your fellow students around you, you know, be nice, be nice to them because they know they may be a project before you do. Well, you know something, we're all involved, and I want to make mm -hmm. sure we don't miss the National Black Theater Festival. We are all involved in that and yeah. been involved and to talk about how important it is for actors and even students to just volunteer and to be among other uh, and networking and, and just talk about that the national black theater festival and uh oh purple you you you're up ladies you first right? on because you can talk about the festival <laughs> yeah, you've, been, you've been hooked up for years yeah uh larry Hammond. yeah one of the mentors, uh, the late Larry Leon Hamlin, one of my mentors uh, in black theater was Larry Hamlin. And he uh, he put us to work. Um, mm -hmm. right, and before the festival was an idea, or before it was reality and it was an idea, you know, I was one, I was on his staff and, you know, I heard him talking about it. And, and he came back from New York from that, one of those meetings and said, look, we're just going to do it here. You guys ready? And we told him we, we'd ride with them. We'd do it. Um, and then uh, when he started laying the groundwork and and putting all that to, all of that together, we were very fortunate to uh, to be there to be a part of all of that. Um, you know, when the first celebrities pulled up uh, in this white, it was really this white limo that this car pulled up. I didn't know who was in the car. Uh, one of my um, fellow college students didn't know who was who was going, who was in the car, and Larry told us to get the door. And when we opened the door. Oprah steps out on my side, my okay. answer is out on his side. We take wow. them to that, that press conference, you know, walk them down. You know, Maya says, you know, Larry, what are, what are these two young men doing this evening? And I said, you <laughs> said, whatever you want, Maya. And there you have it. The rest is history. Uh, uh, Maya said, we'd like these two gentlemen to accompany us this evening. So, <laughs> so, so that evening, uh, I'm at the play. You know, after this, after the gala, I'm at the place sitting between Oprah and and Maya. You know, and then that whole thing became. Wow. Uh, <laughs> you know, something, something, <laughs> I mean, that whole thing became something that is, you know, wow. it's become huge and it become it's become a staple in the theater community. Um, you know, every every year, um, I see somebody that I hadn't seen for a while, or I meet somebody right. new. Me too. Uh, the networking. Uh, for during the readings that take place, yeah. um, you can come in and you know there's so many plays to be read. You can right. meet people. You can actually read in front of people or read with people that you have admired for years. Um, I met August Wilson at the festival. You know, and everybody that I've read about, uh, mm -hmm. Woody King Jr. You know, Woody King, I've, met, yeah. you know, I've met so many people uh, at this festival. Yeah. Um, and it's and it's been good networking because I can go to LA and New York and run into somebody and yeah. you know, 
might get a meal, you know, might, you know, might go to a show that they're in. And then afterwards, you know, we, we get a chance to hang out or something. But it's it's been a, a real good journey. I've gotten at least three, no, probably about about 10 theater jobs over the years from just from the directly from the festival. Wow. You know, uh, just because I was there and and, and, I, and there were so many other job opportunities and possibilities, you know, mm. by just being at the festival, anywhere from teaching to doing workshops to going to New York or L.A. and having somebody that can mentor you while you're there or at least, you know, you know, tell you to keep your chin up, you know, and um, <laughs> you know, nothing else, you know. Um, so it, it's been a, th those festivals have been awesome. Uh, I've been able to to also consult with other people to help with their theater festivals in places like Atlanta, uh, DC, Tampa. So, so yeah, that's been almost a part, as much a part of my life as teaching, actually. Right. Tasha? I like that. I like that. Yes, I um I agree totally. I had the pleasure of um, participating. At the last uh, Black National Theater Festival, I did a commercial workshop there, uh, which was extremely rewarding. I had the pleasure of meeting Professor Meeks there, yeah. uh, among quite a few others. And, um, but I guess it's just like, I'm getting a lot of feedback right, right now. Do you know, is that because we're loud or, or, or is it too loud or something? We're getting a lot um, of feedback. I'm not sure. But I'm I'm pretty sure we'll be going back to Zoom and next next one. Yeah, go ahead. It's not oh, it's not that bad. Okay, okay. Um okay, I just want to make sure you heard me, were able to hear me. Um so yes, I definitely agree that um I agree wholeheartedly it's so important to volunteer on all meetings, you know, if there's an opportunity to be an usher. Uh, just to give out um, programs at a, a theater. You know, I, I do something in the lecture um, when I lecture at universities called what's in your hand. Right. And I use that metaphor for what's in your hand, meaning that every time you're looking for an opportunity, be sure you have something in your hand to offer the person that you're looking to help you in exchange. A uh, good case in point was I had a friend it's a true story, who uh, was pursuing a career in theater, but he could never get past the hump of doing theater, which was a little bit, um, a little on the level of like black box, like lower end theater, which may pay you like a hundred dollars for the five weeks that you're doing it. But right. he wanted to get up to like off Broadway and Broadway levels. So what he decided to do was Every time there was an opportunity to go see a play, he would look on the back of the program. And on the back of the program, it usually lists like your benefactors or mm -hmm. people who are uh, supporters of that theater. They have different levels like diamond and platinum and gold and things like that. So I think the lowest amount they usually ask you to ask you for may be about $25 to be like a patron right. of the theater. And that helps to keep the lights on in the theater. I mean, you know what I'm right. saying? It's going to help financially yeah. keep that theater thriving. And so what this actor decided to do was every theater that he auditioned for, or he wanted to audition for, he became a patron. So he would pay like $25 for every theater show. So after that, probably, I think he probably was a patron for about four or five shows. So we were really good friends. So I used to go out to the theater to support him when he would perform. And then I started noticing every time I turned, um, turned the uh, theater program over, I would notice that he was a patron. And I said, huh, he's in the show here at this theater now, and he's also a patron. Why? I said, that's interesting. So then he moved up to a very top theater um, in New York, which is considered like off Broadway. And he was a patron for them as well. And I said to him, so why are you like a patron for all these theaters? He said, well, when I would go into the audition room, I would say to them, uh, yes, I'm, I'd love to audition for this role. And I'm also a patron for your theater. Yeah. 
So what that did give the theater artistic directors, you see what I'm going with that? Where the, where, what it did was give him leverage to say, um, hey, you're doing this role for August Wilson next season. I'd love to audition for it. And by the way, I'm also a supporter of your theater. Yeah. So it gave him leverage to audition for those theaters. Well, so my he was, was was that you know, I, I auditioned, <clears throat> excuse me, I advise people the same way. If you're looking for a mentor, before you go and approach someone, because they've probably been approached by 10, 15 people within the first two to three months, ask them, hey, can I take you to lunch or can I take you out for a Starbucks coffee? And because <laughs> you came with something in your hand, it's easier to get them to listen to what you have to say versus of saying, hey, I'd love you to be my mentor. I saw you, you know, on the play Francis on Broadway and I just thought you did a great job. Would you mind being my mentor? Right. Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, but the fact that you came to that actor or performer or director and said, hey, I'd love to take you out for an iced coffee at Starbucks. Yeah. Just the fact that you came with something in your hand. They'll remember you. They'll remember you in a good way. Well, yeah. and, and since this is Sunday, that in my neck of the woods, that's called So Where You Want to Go. Yeah. <laughs> that's what you're doing. You're so where you want to be. Um, right. You know, and um, that's, a, that's, that's awesome because cause that, that's a lot. You know, at these festivals, people take me to lunch because they want to pick my brain about a play or about mm -hmm. how to get into the industry. Or, and I oftentimes end up doing things for them um, that, you know, I felt really compelled to do it. I, you know, I was great with it because they showed themselves to be really good people and they were giving as well as wanting to get something. They just, they weren't just trying to take, 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 you know? Yeah. Right. right. Yeah. There's a lot about your integrity so and your character. Question. Well, yeah. right, and I definitely agree to that. Um, so with that being said, how has it been being African-American and being in the theater? Do you find Good it question. to be challenging um, compared to your, you know, Caucasians or maybe Native Americans? I mean, even though we're talking about, you know, systemic racism, do you see that? In your in the, in the industry today, yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, it's even well, from my experience. I'm sorry, did you want to? No, 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 let Andre finish. Go ahead, Andre. He had already started. There was the delay. Go ahead, Natasha. You good, Natasha? Somebody, oh, well, I was just gonna say, from my experience <laughs> with the theater, um, you could easily listen. You can easily look at anything from a racist perspective. You know, right. I mean, mm -hmm. let's face it, most theaters are going to be ran by, uh, by Caucasians, uh, especially the high-end theaters when you're talking Broadway and what have you. What you have to do is set your mind and your will to think about this is what I'm called to do. That's the right. first thing you got to think about. I'm yeah. called to do this. If I'm called to do it, then God is going to make a way for me to have exactly. the vision to do it. The minute you have the vision, the provision will come. But you got to set your will and your mind first, you know, and you'll act out that intention. Mm -hmm. The minute you put in the intention of, oh, well, you know, they don't hire blacks or, oh, they give you, you know, they have so many more male roles than they have female roles. So, I, you know, I'm probably not even ever going to break through in this. That's pretty much what will happen. But when right. you set your intention first, that this is what I'm called to do, something inside of you will rise to the occasion and you will make it happen. So always focus on, I'm called to do this. It's not something I just want to do. I'm called to do it. You know, it's something inside of my heart and my soul that I can't sleep, I can't eat, I can't do anything else but think about getting into that door. And I promise you, those are the folks where the door just opens. It's really yeah. how it happened. And, you know, and I mean, for me, even with um, commercials, I had 70 no's. I had it highlighted on a big calendar. Wow. 70 no's before I got one yes. My wow. agents, 
I was talking to them and I kept my commercial agents, I kept saying to them, why are you guys keep sending me out? I'm not even making any money for you. Right. I mean, you know, I give up on myself and it was 18 months in, 18 months in of hearing nothing but no. And they said to me, we're submitting you, yes, but the production houses keep calling you back in. It's mm -hmm. not really us. Right. right. They keep calling you. So whatever you're doing in the room, just keep doing it. Eventually you're gonna get a break. And I was like, really? But I'm I'm not making you any money. They said, don't worry about it. They keep calling, you just keep doing what you're doing. Somebody's right. gonna give you a break. And that's yeah. what happened. So and because I really believe that I could do it. I was like, I just need to just keep trying because I like I like it. Even though they keep rejecting me, I was like, it's something about it I like. It's yeah. fun to me, you know. I have a, I have a childlike spirit, so I really believe that you have to have the wonderment of a child. You know what I mean? Right. Mm -hmm. You know that feeling that children are just like they're undeniable. Some kids, they just like, they'll force their way in. You have right. to have that. You have to have yeah. that childlike spirit, no matter what you're doing. Never do it. And, and, you know, and, and that's great because that's the way you survive it. That's the way you, you look past what, you know, you could look at and say, oh, yeah, they, they just really are doing me wrong. Uh, you look past it and keep your, mm -hmm. your childlike wonder, keep your joy. You'll, you'll be fine. Right. Uh, I I do I do though want to say that because of the time that we're in, uh, and uh, that a lot of the actors who have ex who have experienced some some things that were blatant and um, some things that were really things that you know that hurt them as individuals because you know they were ostracized or something was said to them uh, that was uh, culturally insensitive that they are now you know holding the theaters and these and these production companies uh and these networks they're gonna hold them to task on the on this support that they're saying that they want to give now because of the you know the different you know stances that they're taking um that you know they have this you know blurb saying that they are in support of black lives matter uh, i think that as long as that continues to be something that we can dialogue about and talk about some of the things that are obvious or some of the things that may not be obvious to them, but is obvious to to, to, uh, to those of us who are in the field. Um, hopefully that will continue and we will actually have some real major breakthroughs. And, um, and even at the local levels with the arts councils in the different cities, right. that there will start to be some, uh, some, some equitable um, practices that take place, you know, especially when it comes to, especially if you have a, a, a large population of a certain culture, that population should get their, that same representation as far as support financially, uh, structurally, um, you know, when it comes to playwrights and being on that, that technical yeah. side, getting into the union. There are a lot of things that have been blatant, some things that people have gotten away with for years uh, that's uh, that's the, mm. you know that, that's something that we can pull up stats on, and and a lot of people are are telling their testimony on Facebook and other platforms that we have to take a look at, and hopefully we can move on from there, so right. that uh, so that we can be better in this industry. I mean, I tell students all the time that this industry is one of the few industries where you can get away with hiring somebody based on what they look like. I mean, right. Because we have to cast people according to what we think that casting criteria is, but you know, oftentimes they've changed their minds. They, 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 you know, some production managers and and agents uh, will go out of their way to make sure that there's that there's you know inclusion. But then you know there have been long-standing practices where that hasn't right. happened, um, and even sometimes when they think it has, it's still not enough for uh, for really what you know is out there. You know, I, I've never seen uh, a studio decide uh, that they can find black actors without without saying, oh, I need to find somebody. You know, I, can you help me find somebody? You know, right. when you have a directing, casting director doing that, you're like, well, you know, HBCUs are graduating five, six black actors a year somewhere in the country, all over the country. Um, so if you really wanted to find mm -hmm. directors, and casting agents and costumers. 
man, we're out here. Um, and I think that the efforts to, to make sure that we are included and that we don't keep seeing the same people over and over again. And so, and that we don't have people coming from other countries getting jobs that, you know, that, you know, and not knocking, you know, the brothers and the sisters who are getting the jobs from other countries. But sometimes you're like, well, we're right here. Nobody bothered to even audition, you know, at this place right, or that right. place, you know, especially well, you in the know, South. You know, you know, most cities in the South that are big are like 30% African-American. Why right. are you not finding right. us? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, one of the things is that we had a talk in another panel I was on this week about having uh, uh, directors looking for black uh, actors for black roles. And actors, yeah. we're actors. We can act. Uh, you can't see me in any role. You know what I'm saying? Why does that have to be a black role? Well, one of the, one of the reasons why I started Agape Theater Project was because I wanted to make sure that black actors had a place to act to do their costuming, to do stage uh, work, lighting, the whole thing. And it's yeah. similar to what Tyler Perry is doing, putting people to work. But that doesn't mean that we can't work in the other industry. We don't need to be just uh, a, a black role that, that we, we like, like, like Natasha was saying, we train for Shakespeare. Right. right. <laughs> we we are Shakespeare trained, so therefore we could do a a, a a role that's considered white. Just give me a chance to audition for it. So right. and like artistic directors at some of these theaters mm -hmm. that are out here, they're only you know they have only been a, a couple African Americans who have been in charge or artistic directors at some of these theaters that are getting state and federal dollars. Uh, and you know, and hopefully that dialogue will begin so that we can break open some of those bar you know break those right. barriers down so that we can that we can be seen uh especially those of us who are trained at their universities right <laughs> uh, you know you need to see see us with equal yeah. you know with, with with the same kind of equal eyes that you see each other so that right. i mean and, and that's all we're asking because we know mm -hmm. uh that we have, we're not talking about the folks that are giving us jobs, the people that in the companies that that have, you know, bent over backwards to make sure that there was an African American play, you know, a right. quarter right. or a year, mm -hmm. you know, because it didn't have to happen, you know. Right. But you know, but there are a lot of right. uh, companies that keep doing the same shows and the same playwrights, and it's like, I, I know they make you money, but you can also right. make you can also make money with shows that have been written by us or directed by us as well. Right. So, yeah. So it's a complicated issue, which is why it's taking. It is a complicated issue. You know, the, the, what do you think about them pulling Gone with the Wind? I mean, just what do you think about? I mean, I, I know what I think, but what do you think about that? That's a tough question, because technically we were raised on Gone with the Wind. <laughs> and you know, here in, in North Carolina, that plays quite often, and it's like so. And you know that Hattie McDaniel won that you know an Oscar for playing Black. that role. So I'm like, okay, I'm kind of used to seeing that, but I can understand people of this generation who are not used to seeing that that film and consider it um, offensive. It I grew is. up on it. I grew up on it. Didn't think anything about it. You know, enjoyed the line. I don't know nothing about birth no babies. I mean, that was that was that we talked that we that we said about the movie. You know, so so I get it though yeah. and that now yeah. we're in a yeah. new day that we have to think about those things because that's how we fall asleep sometimes and accept right, some of the right. things that we probably shouldn't be accepting. So Michelle, we gotta wrap this up. Oh, okay. You got anything on talk? Uh, guys, you got any final thoughts? Uh, I appreciate you, brother, and the work that you're doing. Oh, um, final thoughts. Um, no, I think that, you know, this has been very informative. I know there are some individuals that are, you know, making this comment in the uh, comment box on live. Um, I appreciate both of you, Andre and Natasha, and of course, you two can um, to give some insight to those that are out there and that are, you know, inspiring to do more in their um, 
you know, in their journey in acting, whether it's mm-hmm. acting, voiceover, or just even being behind the scenes to know how to bring it all together. Yeah. And and for people who don't know that it's a lot of work, it's a lot of work, you know. So, uh, so don't walk into this industry if you're just new to it, thinking that, you know, you got it and you just, you know, you did one show and you're a star. It's like, that's right. so much. So much more to do, so much training. Oh, that takes away from the confidence. I got Go this. <laughs> I want you to have it, but I want you to have it, but also understand that there's more to get, you know? Right, exactly. <laughs> we love the confidence, right. you know? Um, just have to also make sure that everybody's thoughtful and mindful about uh, and respectful of the, of the work that has to be done for you right. to really be good at this, you know? And you, and you can't be afraid to be in the bottom ring and to move up in the world. The, the more you are around theater, you, you might just be uh, a hand today, but tomorrow you might be moved up to uh, props. The next day you're moved up to, uh, to working with the, the costume. And then next thing you know, you're working with lighting. And then when you get your break to be on stage, you better be ready, like Andre said, you know, I said, do, do you have a do you have a, a, a monologue? Oh yeah, I got a monologue. I've been keeping yeah. this one for you know. So you got to be ready. <laughs> so this field yeah. is like that. And 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 as a teacher, I try to. They said, Professor Hinton, you have so much passion. Yes, I have passion. I have. You passion. gotta love it. Yeah. Love what I do. You yeah, know I what I'm. And you know what, Professor Hinton, I will say this about you, but people may not know, when you get a chance to see Professor Hinton on stage, when you get to see him perform, see, it's one thing to teach, you teach acting, but when you innately have the gift to act, like it's in your blood to really perform the way you do, it's, I'm telling you, I fly in from New York, he'll tell you, I will fly in to see him do anything, anytime. He's so committed to the craft of being an actor himself. Right. So it's one thing to teach it. It's one thing to respect the, the medium of, of theater, but it's another thing to actually be an innate actor, like have that gift, and he has it. And I always say, honey, you ever decide to come to New York, <laughs> it's going to be a, a totally different thing to you because you would really, really do well in the theater well, in New York. You're really exceptional. You. It. Yeah. I just want to let our audience know mm-hmm. next week, and we'll be playing a rerun in this uh, uh, in this time slot. But the following week, we have April Parker Jones um, uh, and Lauren Banks of Showtime. She's on the Showtime show, and Mr. Wendell Tab, who was responsible for uh, their mentor. So Michelle and I will be back yeah. on the eighth and taking a break next week. And thank you for joining us. For Theater Talk Live, Agape Theater Project presents. So take care, everybody. Thanks, Thank Michelle. You. Yes. Thank Love you guys. Thank you. you. Love I enjoyed you. it. Bye, everyone. Good to see you all. I miss you all. Thank you. Be safe. Be safe. Good night. Looking forward to seeing you guys. Yes. Right. You too. Okay. Bye bye. Bye bye.